Hello. Uh, yeah, so my name's Adem. Thank you for that uh, illustrious introduction. Um, uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, yeah, I put on gigs and other kinds of music activity. My therapist has told me to stop saying the word stuff because apparently it sounds reductive. So I'm going to say activities. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm a bald-headed, black mixed race man uh, with a beard. And I'm going to ask each of my panellists, fellow panellists now to, to introduce themselves with their name, pronoun, a word describing what they do, and giving a brief visual description. Hello everybody, I'm Talia. I am a singer, songwriter, artist. Um, I'm a black woman with shoulder length locks, um, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi everyone. My name is Manta Woman slash Raylan Yant. You can call me Manta or Ray. I take they, them pronouns or she, her, if you're feeling inspired. Mm -hmm. And I am a Chinese mixed race person with long brown hair. And I've got some makeup on today. Oh, and I'm a musician and a performing artist. Um, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Hilton. I'm a lecturer in contemporary art here at SOAS. Um, I've been here about a year. Um, I'm the son of a Jamaican father and Spanish mother, um, and I'm a he, um, so that's me. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. Mara? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Amara Spence, pronoun she, her. Um, I'm a black woman with um, remarkable black difference. Um, and I'm an artist, a uh, performing artist, um, increasingly a transdisciplinary artist and a spatial practitioner. And I'm overwhelmed to be here in some capacity. So thank you so much. Beaming live from the Midlands, which we love. <laughs> I love the yeah, got right the gum fingers. So we are. Thank you so much for being here. We're we're really keen for this to feel as much like a conversation as we can, a chat. We're here to talk about the relationship between visual arts and music, sound and music. Um, I think it's really interesting for all of us that we sometimes find ourselves in well all kinds of boxes, but those those two. What what is visual arts? What is music? And so I wanted to kind of kick off the conversation with that and come to you, Richard, and hear what you think about um are there distinctions between should there be distinctions between those two things thank you thank you adam and thank you casper for inviting me um it's a great opportunity to talk about a subject i was just saying um to Ireland that um a few years ago i taught a course um in london on music culture identity and i'd completely forgotten i'd done it when i was putting this together until i'd finished it but um it's a great topic and i realized i could probably do a module on it <laughs> But um, so um, so what I wanted to do is just to show some images to just to start to, to introduce a, what this is really my kind of take, obviously, on this and coming from it at, from a more kind of historical view of looking at the relate intersections between visual arts and music, but looking at it post partly personally, but also looking at it through um, the ways in which um, there's a kind of to and fro in between these disciplines and the blurring of the disciplines and also the ways in which these things change over time and get recycled through music but also through the way artists reference um, music as well in their work. So I've just got a few slides that I wanted to show, so Casper, that's great. So I thought I'd start with this image here because um, I think when Casper asked me to talk about um, this, you know, I was thinking that, you know, for me, and I'm probably showing my age, if I look around the room, I'm probably showing my age that, um, you know, records and vinyl and albums are really kind of, they're something that I grew up with, you know, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is the first album um, I got in 1978. I still have it. And there was something very exciting about it. You know, I think it was my mum worked as an office cleaner manager and one of her supervisors, for some reason, went to a shop in the East End somewhere and got it and it came back in a bag and it was like this really exciting moment. And um, there's something about the object. First of all, if you think about visual arts and vis the visual aspects of the relationship between music and the album itself, I don't know how many people in this room have records, vinyl records. Okay, 
Okay, so 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 those of you who don't, so there's something very much. Obviously, they take up a lot of space because I have quite a lot of them that take up a lot of space. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to start with this image because it was like the first, and obviously, clearly as well, there's something about the design. And when you look at kind of designers and who get, you will see in a moment, designers that get used to um, to do these to make these album covers. Um, there's a kind of a whole history to that as well. So, um, Casper, could you um, move on to the next? I've just got a few early slides. So just do that one first. So this is another example. So has anyone seen this album? This is an album from 1971, Black Moses. And so, again, talking about the idea of the object. So these, this incredible musician produces this album. But if they go to the next slide, it's not just any old album. It's an album that folds out into this almost life-size figure. So, again, you know, we can think about the ways in which, you know... Um, the artists as well, just artists are thinking about how they present themselves to, to, to an audience um, through, their, through, through the packaging of their music. Um, the next slide, please, Casper. And then this, again, this is, a, this is an interesting story. Um, so this is the album Catch a Fire by the Whalers, um, released in 1973. If you go to, so this is a um, Zippo lighter. This is a kind of enlargement of a Zippo lighter. So when they made this album... <laughs> Um, they, um, it's a fantastic album, you know, in the way it's, it's packaged, you know, Catch a Fire, the Zipper Light, all this, you know, it's got a picture of the whalers on the back. But because of the design, the little um, rivet there kept breaking, so they had to kind of junk it and then produce a new, more conventional LP. So I've got one of these. It was actually my stepbrother's album. I've got it, and they're worth quite a lot of money now, and it's not broken. So, um, so anyway, so just again, this kind of, this di this kind of dynamic. So the next slide, please, Casper. Um, so this is an image. Um, so this is an image um, by um, an art, American artist, Charles White, um, incredible artist, and he was very interested in this idea of his work not just being shown in galleries, but reaching a big audience. So he he was he was commissioned by Vanguard to produce many album covers in the fifties, and this is one of them. So again, this is kind of this thing thinking through this idea of the relationships between music and packaging and artists. Next slide, please, um, Casper. And of course, we can jump to the 1980s um, and this image um, of um, Grace Jones' compilation album from 1985 by a photographer her, and her then her then partner, um, um, Jean Paul Good. Um, and next slide, please. So then we can then start to think about, and this is really just to kind of throw some things, thinking about um, the ways in which, rather than looking at this in a linear fashion, you know, the ways in which it cross generations. So we've got Pierre Mondrian, Mondrian there, and his, his interest in jazz and how it influenced his painting in the, in the 40s. And he's, in, he's kind of influenced of being in Paris and, and meeting jazz musicians there and, um, and also soldiers. Um, and his interests grew in jazz and, and influenced his work. Um, and then obviously we've got Jean-Michel Basquiat who... Um, spoke a lot and was very much influenced and very much influenced by um, musicians like Charlie Parker. Um, next slide, please, um, Casper. Thank you. Um, and then we kind of, again, this idea of the visual and the kind of relationship, things that might be hidden from us, you know, that again resonate. So we've got this very um, famous iconic image of, from the Second World War of American soldiers putting the flag there and how it's been reinterpreted by Funkadelic in the 70s but interpreted in a, in a particular way using the, um, the, the, um, the Marcus Garvey um, um, Pan-Africanist flag here. So next fl slide, please. And then we've got David Hammond's American artist producing um, his version of Stars and Stripes that incorporates the, the Pan-Africanist flag. And talking of flags, next slide, please. Um, we've got Faith Ringgold's Flag for the Moon. Um, produced in 1969, but then we can also think of this album, first album, I think it is, Gil Scott Heron, um, um, Whitey on the Moon. So again, this is kind of dialogue um, that we can see, the ways in which these things can be kind of hidden from us in terms of the relationship, how artists are listening to music, and, you know, and vice versa in many respects as well. Um, oh, and, talk, and then, and then we, yeah, the next slide, thank you. And then... Um, this one, this Gustav Metzger, a very important um, German-British artist who died not long ago, um, very, at the age of, in his 90s, about 94. And um, he was a kind of um, the inventor, if you like, or the innovator of autodestructive art. And this is one of his famous performances on the South Bank where he used hydrochloric acid to burn these sheets. And um, purportedly one of the influences for 
the guitarist from The Who for smashing his guitar, Pete Townsend, here from 1967. So again, you know, this, this kind of relationship. Um, next slide, please, um, Casper. Um, so, and then music. And, and in Britain, you know, we can think of um, reggae and reggae from the 70s and 80s, kind of conscious reggae and its influence on artists. And um, is, anyone, is anyone familiar with... Um, is anyone familiar with this song um, by Johnny Osborne, 13 Dead, Nothing Said? Mm. Is anyone familiar? So the next slide, please, Casper. Then from 1982, British artist Keith Piper produced this work, um, and it was about the, the fire, the New Cross fire in, in 1981, which killed 13, a, a house fire, a, a house party, and there was a fire, and 13 um, teenagers died. Um, and this sparked one of the biggest, um, the biggest, and um, of the, Black People's Day of Action in 1981 and marched through London. But we can see there the, the, the formulation with Keith Piper, the kind of the first generation of British-born um, black artists who are going to art school and the influence of reggae on their work as well. Um, so that, um, and then there's another image actually, again, the music, um, Bernie Spear, Marcus Garvey. So this is Eddie Chambers who was here a couple of weeks ago. So this is one of his works from the 1980s, taking the lyrics from Burning Spear and using these like images, these framed images of African art artefacts. Um, um, next slide, please, Casper. And we can go across the Atlantic as well. So from the 70s, um, American art, another important American artist, Sengen and Goody, this idea of performance and the masquerade and the spirits. And um, this performance, this improvised performance took place on the um, um, freeway, underneath the freeway in Los Angeles. Um, um, next slide, please. And then we can come back to London and we can see this work um, Dancing in Peckham by the British artist um, um, Gillian Waring, um, where she danced for 25 minutes in, this, in the Aishon Centre in Peckham um, with a song in her head. She was dancing onto a camera, well, obviously a camera, so there's a film. You can probably see bits of this online. Um, and then I put this one in because of the next one that follows it, to so the ways in which artists arose to kind of influence, what artists kind of influence or rep represent something. So she went around the streets asking people to write a note about, as the title says, signs that say what you want them to say and not signs that say what someone else wants you to say. So this, this is it. And then we can see where perhaps that idea perhaps generated from. So, you know, there's these kind of like, these kind of um, relationships. And, and it's just a couple more... Um, Example. So we've got this album here, The Blues and the Abstract Truth from 1961. And I just want to show one more image of David Hammond's work. Um, so this is a work from 1997. And it was in this museum in, in, in Bern. And I actually went to, remember going to see this. It was a very small entrance, very kind of diminutive space. And you go in, it's huge. And there was nothing in any of the galleries. It's very hard to, fo and to, to um, copy images from this book because it's long and thin. But I just took this one image. So what he did was just, the rooms just had things like a, a sheet in the corner. And underneath the sheet was a boombox playing some music. And then, but he put this film on all the windows. So the light would change during the course of the day. And at, one, at some point, the, the room was filled with blue. And then this, this is the last room. So just like this one, he used to, he, he was saying, yeah, well, I did this piece because, um, you know, in, um, they used to always say that cat on the drums, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of like, <laughs> so it's like, and it's a pink drum kit and it's like the last thing you see in the exhibition. So again, it's like quite playful idea about the ways in which the, the uh, musicians are referred to as well, this kind of connection. Um, and then just to wrap up, I just wanted to um, play a little clip of this fantastic um, piece. I actually saw this in, and it was my partner who reminded me about this actually, I saw this a few years ago in the Art Institute in Chicago. And it's this great video by um, an artist called Colleen Smith who moved to Chicago and she set up this um, orchestra called the um, Solar Flair Orchestral Marching Band. And it was based, it was for a school in um, Rich South High School in Chicago. And Obviously, Chicago has this history of, of music, um, blues, et cetera, but it's also the, the city of migration. So where um, black Americans escaped the brutality of the American South, they m migrated and Chicago is one of the cities. Um, and Sun Ra, who this song, this piece is kind of dedicated to, the, the jazz musician, he was a man of the South. He was born in Alabama, but he spent a time living in Chicago. 
And um, so she did this kind of what they call a flash mob performance where this band went in, into Chinatown and performed. So it's kind of interesting intercultural um, way of presenting oneself in, in a different space, but not in a kind of in a, not in a kind of um, regulated form, you know, with tickets and a performance and a stage. So if you could just play this clip. So they're actually um, performing one of um, Sun Ra's songs. Spaces to play. So at one point during this, it's absolutely raining. It's raining and they're just carrying on and it's just it's incredible. It goes on for about 10 minutes. You can see this online actually, and it's a great. So this is all connects again to this idea of space and the relationships between the visual and the kind of aura, if you like. Um, and particularly someone like Sun Ra, who used the kind of, you know, Sun Ra meaning Sun Sun, you know, so this idea of space and the outer space and space within America, like another way of looking at the world that we live in, all the world that he lived in. So, um, so yeah, there's just some ideas to start off. So thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's really interesting to, to, see, to get that context and think about how there's feels like almost always been this interplay between um music artists th thinking about presenting their work visually and, and visual artists using music in in their practice as well tower i wanted to come to you first still asking this question about if there are distinctions between those two things mm -hmm. you've just put out a new out al incredible new album which is available yeah. on all streams and no, thank you. other places i'm sure soon yes yes, yes. um that's really interesting because that sort of began life in lots of different ways. I wonder if you yeah. could talk a bit about the process of the, Eartha. Yeah, the process of, yeah. of Eartha and, and... Oh, this is Eartha. Well, it's me, but representing Eartha. Um, so this album was created with Al Moore, who's a visual artist um, and a writer and just a great human in general. And um, she came to me with the the visual identity of Eartha, um, poetry, um, and we had loads of conversations and it was like, would you be up for creating the musical world for Eartha? Um, and that's how it started. So for me, that process of um, creating an album from a visual identity, from images, from um, uh, stories, that's kind of the first time I've done it. And it was a beautiful experience actually it challenged me in many ways i grew up in the church so my my kind of uh way of creating is always just to catch the spirit okay i sit on the piano whatever comes comes and it flows through me but this was really like bringing everything back to the narrative does it feel like Eartha? is this part of the story does, it's good and you know al's funny because she's not a musician um but she's like that's that's not how it feels. And I'm like, oh, what you know, man, this is banging. What are you talking about? And she's like, no, no, you're taking it too much over. The I'm like, no, you're right. You're right. Let me get back to, okay, where are we here in the journey? And um, so that was really cool as well. And also just kind of creating in the space when I started writing, um, I had visuals like up on the projector that Al had sent me and images and just really taking the, the visual identity of Eartha um, and kind of letting that flow through me and come through it, uh, the music was um, a really interesting way for me to work. Super cool. And this is actually it's really good that we stopped oh, at this yes. picture, um, which is this is at the South this Bank Centre. This is at Center. the South Bank Centre. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what's really interesting about the live version of Earth, mm -hmm. it felt like the how that. I mean, you were very clear in, because we also did a show at the Horniman. Yes. You, which I loved, you were, you had such a clear idea of exactly how it needed to, you and Al, how it should look, how it should feel. Sure. And I, I wonder how, could you just speak a bit about yeah. that and how that kind of comes together with the music? Definitely. I think again, so with this project, Al, it was, re it's, it's kind of really important that I'm in a way not Tarbia on the stage. Like I'm, 
leaning into earther like i become earther which is why we play a lot with scale that first image is like i'm super tall people are like oh you're tall in that yes 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 um <laughs> but it's that kind of um creating that otherworldly um persona and in a way earther you know we want earther to kind of be somebody that can represent everybody um and so for the live show it was also important that um, you know, again, playing with scale, having the choir on the plinths, having me up there and kind of playing with light. So at the top, um, the show starts at the top where, you know, we, it's birth and there's light. And as I move down, it's like child, youth, adult, and then going back up to elder and death. And, um... And so, oh yeah, and and this is also this is the uh, album artwork, um, and again, like this is birth, child, youth, adult, elder, death, and that's actually based on me. So I stood there and did all those, and Al did the lino print um, from those images. So every aspect of of the artwork um, was considered by Al, and the music. Um, was created in response to all of it, all of those things, and it's it yeah, and also just feel it being so involved with the artwork as well, mm. like supposing for the artwork, and then Al doing the lino prints, but then it feeling oh yeah, that's based on me, but it's not me. It's, it's been really interesting um, so, working but, in this way, and if, so it feels like those are really the both the visual elements and the musical elements are. It's about ex exploring the same ideas or the same themes in, through those two different mediums. Absolutely. I want to, if I can, come to. Um, our correspondent in the Midlands. Yes. Um, come to Amara. Um, I wanted to ask you, Amara, um, the same question, really. How, in your, from your perspective, do you see, as someone who's a practicing artist, but also, you know, producer and space holder, how how do you feel about those distinctions between visual arts and music? Thank you for this question, and thank you to um, previous speakers who have kind of influenced um, my, my response to this because Tawi are talking about this almost intuitive, you know, a, a tapping into a spirit um, is something that I'm like, yeah, let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love this idea of, um, of acknowledging that I am shape-shifting and mm. that my artistic practice is also shape-shifting. Mm. And I get geeked out about meeting other transdisciplinary artists and artists who are intentionally moving away from the binaries that we find in artistic practice, in creation, um, and in removing from those uh, binaries, in, in intentionally moving from those binaries, what then do we, what then do we grow? Um, and there's so much in this where I'm like, I mean, I started an organization in uh, 2013 called Maya. And the reason for starting it was as an artist who felt like I couldn't access opportunities in Birmingham um, and increasingly um, being forced into these binaries that felt in like misaligned to how I actually wanted to make work. It was like the only way is to create your own container. The only way is to, is to, is to build your own infrastructure and how common this is as, a, as, as artists, right? We build the infrastructure to support our creative practice. And so Maya started with a very, I'll say affirmingly, naive premise. How do we support artists like us to do what they love for a living? And it was like, you know, that's all we want to do. Like, we just want people to be themselves and, and to make however they want to make and that they should be able to survive from doing that. Um, but of course, what happened very quickly is you butt up against all of the systemic things that actually stop people like us from, be, from being able to express ourselves in any capacity. Mm. So it made total sense that we would also be forced into binaries in every capacity. Mm. So I love this question because for me, it reminds me that there are so many practitioners, there are so many people who are wanting to go beyond the binary. And also that binary for many people stops us from even thinking that artistic practice is a pursuit that we can take. Mm. You know, so many people, I work um, in a community in Birmingham um, that by every, you know, traditional metric of um, social injustice, 
and environmental injustice and economic injustice. This is one of the, the neighborhoods that has been failed by our country. And we have so many people that we say, there's something really precious about being able to take an idea and give it form and give it materiality and give it nuance and give it context. And those people tend to call it survival. They tend to just say like, oh, this, I'm just surviving. And I'm like, isn't that the, the beauty of artists? Isn't that what we do to give ideas form, to give ideas materiality and nuance? So as an artist, I look at my my work um, and, and, the, and the work that I produce and support and facilitate as can we apply that same practice of giving ideas form, no matter what form, rhythm, materiality they take, can we rehearse freedom? Can we rehearse liberation? Can we practice mm. that, what that look like? Um, so that's where I get really geeked out because then I'm like, sometimes what we rehearse sounds choral. Mm -hmm. It sounds sonic, you know, it has a sonic quality. It, it sounds, sometimes it's like, it sounds like jazz improvisation. And, you know, if you're, if you're not careful or if you don't study jazz, you're like, yo, improv, like I can do that. Whereas improv is like, I'm going to train my ass off right so that i can improv and it's this badass mm. but we're like how do we do that as a collective you know endeavor what does that look like what can collective practices like theater ensembles that i'm that i've grown up in what can that teach mm. us about how we rehearse mm. liberation i'm gonna stop because i'm so excited I'm <laughs> no i'm getting your <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yes it's thank what you. it's what what you're making me think about is so i, I love you talking about this about rehearsing mm. freedom and i my, i want to come back to you because my question to, to what you just said is so is in this context is so is freedom expressing and and is expressing creativity without form or without restriction without binary I think that's a, that's a big part of freedom and ultimately the being able to be ourselves safely mm. and generatively is freedom. And so expression of that is part of that because that, you know, if we have the agency and the freedom to choose how we express ourselves and that's part of it. Yeah, um, yeah. But I love this idea of, you know, um, the, 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 the different shapes with which our expression can take and that we allow ourselves the freedom to be intuitive, mm. to tap into spirit, to really allow ourselves the capacity to do that is in itself a liberatory practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, Ray, I have to come to you next. Um, and what I think is so interesting about your practices is that you've got... Well, I don't... You can, you can explain, but you've got a few you've had a few different ways in which you've expressed your creativity that have his, have maybe previously been separate and I know that you're looking at how you how you bring those together so I'd love to hear a bit about your reflections on what we've heard and and maybe um, explain to the audience a bit about what you all the things that you do okay I feel like we're making music right now I, and maybe it's because I'm sitting between everyone and I just feel so honoured um, so much is resonating, materializing the music through a uh, vinyl cover, mm. rendering the spirit um, through the visual, creating the spaces that we wish to inhabit. Um, all of this really resonates. Um, and I think what I can offer is I can speak to my experience growing up within the Chinese music tradition and the visual elements of performance that I learned through that. Um, I can talk t about the performance of gender and how that discovery personally happened through visual media. It happened through social media and, and the screen. Um, and then me trying to then embody what's inside through visual performance, and then also um, collective envisioning with Tangram, which is a, an artist collective I co-direct with Alex Ho, who's in the audience. Um, we seek to transcend the China West divide by making music. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with what's here. I play this instrument, it's called the Yang Qin, 
also known as the Chinese hammer dulcimer. And as you can see, the visual is important to the instrument. You have these decorations of bamboo in kind of the lattices of the stand. You have lotus made out of abalone shell decorating the box itself. And on the surface, what you can't see are steel strings stretched across, which I hit with bamboo mallets. Um, the visual in Chinese music extends to what we typically wear. I chose something a bit more tame in this shot, but traditionally you wear these very bright and shiny red vests and um, qi pao. Um, and our teachers would teach us to perform um, very visually. They, I, like Just one detail is, is they would teach us to express with our eyebrows mm. when we're playing. So it's, it's always kind of been enmeshed with, with, with visual art. Um, but I think uh, more... Some, uh, an, another way this happens in Chinese music is the pieces um, tend to express an image in nature. A lot of Chinese music is this way. So traditional pieces like purple bamboo, thunder after the drought, um, spring arrives on the Qing River, very different than, say, Western classical music where it's like opus four, number three, <laughs> movement five, you know. Um, where there's this purity of like, let's distill and let's remove this from the material world in a way. Let's distill it to pure music. In, 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 in the Chinese tradition, it's like, you know, you can hear the birds chirping on the river and you can hear the water flowing and the, the, the gravity of the mountain. So in that way, visual elements were always woven into my practice. And then if you move to the next slide, this is from last year post-lockdown, watching Drag Race for the first time, mm. stillness, solitude, making me realize there were parts of myself I was not listening to, and coming to terms with my gender fluidity. And this was my attempt at, at kind of bringing that forth. It was um, my first video as Manta Woman, who's my avatar performance persona, um, and this was uh, kind of a response to seeing so much chaos unfold, um, th you know, through the interface of the screen, and and you know, seeing um, the coup attempt unfold on the United States Capitol on January sixth, twenty twenty one, and for a solid couple of minutes, not processing it as real. So the surreal, the hyperreal, and the real all kind of blending together um, in, in the digital age. Me, I, I'm trying to navigate that and, in, and, and trying to project the values of love and adaptability and oceanic consciousness that I hope to see reflected on the other side of the screen. So this was a cover of Eurythmics' Here Comes the Rain Again. Um, directed by my friend Emma Henry Wolf, who is a visual artist. That was my first experience working with a visual artist, um, and yeah, trying to trying to render something. Um, and then the next slide. This is from our last performance, our most recent performance uh, with Tangram, a concert car called "Our Silence Is Your Silence." staged on the 70th anniversary of John Cage's um, notorious piece, 433, um, which if you haven't heard of that before, it was a piece where the pianist walked on stage, sat at the piano, and basically did nothing, performing quote-unquote silence mm -hmm. for four minutes and 33 seconds before leaving the stage. This made a lot of waves in Western contemporary music, and there was a lot of inspiration from Eastern philosophies, Taoisms, and Buddhism. And so this was my cover <laughs> of that piece. Um, and I think there's another image. Basically, I kind of emerge from the cage of the Yang Qin and step out with this mask, which was, which I commissioned from Damselfrau, who's an incredible mask maker someone who I encountered on Instagram, you know, very much like accepting that that's a part of reality and culture, um, however reluctantly. Um, 
and uh, yeah, kind of tr uh, trying to reflect something to the audience, whatever they whatever they saw in that moment. Uh, the piece was called "Everything Is Music." Um, but what was most special, and this will be the last thing I say for now, about this gig is that we worked with um, two deaf artists to realize this concert. Louise Stern, who's a writer and filmmaker, and Ted Evans, who's a filmmaker. And we learned so much through that process, taking, you know, you know, Louise in the very beginning said, you know, we're not interested in talking about access, we're talking about something much more fundamental and much more human, about how are we communicating with each other and how are we um, being present with each other. What is silence? Because for people who are deaf, silence means nothing. Mm -hmm. So what are you saying? You know, and um, we wove her writing into the performance. We had Ted visually interpret the concert with his camera. Um, live streaming picture in picture, different emotive, kind of abstracted uh, moments from the performance onto the screen for everyone to experience. And that was just a very, um, yeah, a very, very um, instructive and, and moving experience to be a part of. Amazing, thank you. I think what so I want to come to all of you in a minute. As I said, I'm really keen for this to be a conversation with all of us. So um, please start thinking of questions because I'll come to you really, really soon. But Richard, I want to come back to you first. So we've the conversa quite a lot of the conversation has been about um, artists and creativity trying to break outside of boxes and binaries. And I wondered what your thoughts were on how... I guess identity and 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 society, in, from your perspective, impacts artists' ability to do that. Um, hmm, that's a, a question. Um, well, I think some of the examples um, I, I showed. I think um, some artists, I suppose, have uh, visual artists have kind of in, an interest in music and try to kind of um, use elements of it. W kind of I suppose to kind of challenge the way in which space is used gallery space is used um it's I think some of the work I purposely looked back rather than looking at the contemporary because I knew the kind of steamed company we're going to be talking about very much the contemporary um and I think it's interesting to look back at work and look back at work which isn't um in a different kind of producing a different age so even when we come to the end um the David Hammond's piece in 2000, 1997, that was kind of really pre-internet and a different kind of world, you know, and I think um, for me, it's, it's interesting to think about work that was produced 20, 30 years ago, how it exists now in the world with artists that, that as, as that's been to talk about, as Marv has been talking about in terms of this interdisciplinarity and the, these different sorts of technologies that make producing work not necessarily just within the gallery or 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 kind of defined sort of practice as a kind of that like visual artist you know so i think those things are quite um those things are kind of quite significant in terms of contemporary practitioners who are kind of using and drawing in different sorts of disciplines now where kind of the kind of i suppose the kind of diff delineations once were clearer in terms of artists will use make reference to to music or um music has been has, makes reference to art um i think um i'm not sure I, I think that in terms of um i'm kind of interested in the ways in which um so with colleen smith piece that piece in a way it's kind of it's it's sort of um there's lots of things about it which aren't kind of polished, so it's like the way in which it's filmed, you know, and the way, because of the nature of it, it's like this idea of not staging something, so this idea of doing something impromptu. So that, in a way, is something perhaps that um, is very different nowadays because there's a lot more um, ways in which to kind of present work in a more formal way. Do you, do you know what I mean? So this idea of um, just doing something that's kind of not announced but you just do it in a space so those kind of things which kind of step outside of the idea of the kind of um commodity 
and the kind of the idea of a traditional audience. So those things I kind of think are interesting for artists when you're making work that isn't kind of necessarily um, for a particular audience. It just exists. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of different way. And some of the some of the work there may be trying to do that. So that even like going back to kind of like Charles White. Yeah drawing making being commissioned to make work on works on album covers you know in the 50s you know that's not something that's kind of necessarily announced at the time that this artist was doing that in the same way as the sort of flab um the um the kind of flash mob um choir was producing something uh, in a way that wasn't announced but it was recorded and then presented retrospectively so that's kind of for me where it, it can be interesting where someone's doing something that's not sort of um telegraphed or promoted in a similar kind of way so that's kind of interesting yeah so it's, uh, yeah really interesting and i think audiences expectations of of pieces of art in in whatever form can completely alter things i think we yeah, who the audience is as yeah. well who is the audience and, and do it in a also what yeah. so we just had christine and the queens present red car at the south bank center it was either yesterday or two days ago <laughs> i've been it's been <laughs> saying to Tawia just before it's been a full-on week so i'm losing track of days but and they so christine and the queens like you know in some ways is people would think of as a pop act mm -hmm. someone who does jules holland and gets played on radio one but it's like very much um an interdisciplinary artist and mm -hmm. so the, the the gig that they present that he presented was a conceptual piece that had a through line it wasn't playing the hits like mm -hmm. if you know christine and the queens uh, they didn't. He, he didn't perform Tilted. It was the new album mm -hmm. played in the way in which that they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I, as a programmer, was curious about how the audience might receive that. Are they going to expect an encore with the hits? Are they going to, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and how's that going to work? But I think I'm a big believer in trusting artists. That's and good. yeah, yeah. I, I really felt that way as well with Eartha because it was, you know. It's like we're going to perform it as it is. I'm not going to play any of my old tracks or anything. It's just Eartha. That's what you're going to get. And my agent was like, are you sure, babe? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Um, and, you know, I was supporting Michael Kiranuka as well. And, and it's it's a concept album. It's from birth to death. That's how we're going to do it. And it is nerve-wracking. And actually, the beginning of... of the show, there's a, well, not for the Kiwanuka tour, but for my own show, there's like a 10 minute soundscape and a film. And again, that's just to get people into, like, just from watching gigs, people go to gigs and they're chatty patties. I'm like, why are you chatting <laughs> out? Uh, <laughs> and um, so for me, it was like, I want you to come into the space and to just take a minute and hear the soundscape and see the visuals and know that we're about to go on a journey. Mm. And um, and again, like comments like, oh, the soundscape's a bit long. Maybe you should just, you need to just come on straight away. <laughs> like, mm. it's like, no, I actually, I, I, I want you guys to be present. I want it to feel like, all right, we're about to embark on a journey and I want you to come mm. with me. And that's my intention. And so, but, you know, it is kind of scary because... Um, you're you're challenging. Well, I'm challenging myself and also the audience's expectation of what they're going to get. Oh, hello. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> it's Twenty nine sec seconds of the soundscape. Is that? Oh, uh, the soundscape. I think the soundscape's the first. The first. Do, do you want one? Do you want me to play it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, can play it. The, the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Since you were talking about it, I thought it was appropriate. Hold on a second. Oh no, for sure. That's what you get at the beginning of the show. <laughs> snippet of it but yeah you get it for 10 minutes and the when I did it at the South Bank I had a choir so each choir member came on just like every minute and just stood there people like <laughs> it was cool man it was so cool <laughs> yeah. yeah I love that but yeah I'm just it's yeah I think 
it was also really liberating to be able to um, present Eartha exactly how we wanted to. Um, and I think it paid off. <laughs> you were in a you, yeah, you yeah. Were, But yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, that's what, you know, art is for me, is just being able to express myself and, and hope that people, the audience, vibrate with it, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's the most important thing for me as an artist is that um, it's honest and true. And then I can, if people don't like it, I'm all right. But if I'm out here trying to create things because what's hot right now, um, that's that's setting me up for failure. So Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I have this kind of personal philosophy that an audience's experience of live music mm -hmm. doesn't just start the second the band or the artist walk on stage mm -hmm. and actually my my job and people i work with is to bring the audience into the world of mm -hmm. what's happening on stage mm -hmm. from the second they find out it's happening Absolutely. until well after and part of that's about setting the audience up in the right way and saying this is what you're about to experience mm -hmm. it's not it's not just the greatest hits yeah. show and some of those show listen like we have oh we love it yeah we love From it time time. yeah I, I went to see Gladys Knight at the Albert Hall a couple of weeks ago She a couple of weeks ago a month or so ago it was great she played the hits yeah. me and Auntie Audrey went and we had another yes. time <laughs> but there are other shows where it's a different thing mm -hmm. and I think it's about finding the right way to talk about that in the moments but so I, I want to bring um, everyone else into the room with us so has has anybody got any questions or or thoughts they'd like to share Please. Um, I, I really liked the last clip you showed there. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I was expecting to see more of that, to be honest, rather than a lot of talk. The question I have is... Uh, <laughs> it, it is a panel discussion. Thank you, thanks for your bluntness. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. You can... You have to get tickets for Tawia's next show. Yeah, Come to the it's next just show. a little taste. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing that stuck in my head, and I couldn't get it out because I remember that that word uh, transdisciplinary, and I couldn't get that out of my head because I thought I know what it means, but I don't know what it means. It's one of these words that that I think well, what, I know interdisciplinary, and I think well, what's the difference? Mm. And then I I and you you talk a lot about you know expectations of gallery expectations, spectator expectations, and I thought, well, that's been the case since Duchamp. So again, what's the difference? That, so I would, that's, that's, you know, I know that, that then you talked about um, the cage piece and you put it in context, and I thought that was quite, so I wonder, is that the difference? That basically you're just, you're just sort of for a, say, a contemporary audience, you're, you're making references to the past. Is it anything new, or is it just referencing? Because, again, you talk about events and they're like happenings. Mm. Again, I got a bit confused. I was got a bit confused about why you didn't show any sort of punk album covers, which is DIY stuff. Mm. And that is, to me, a sort of the art, the, the the musician being the artist, and then you got people like, you know, talking heads who basically started <laughs> off in art school. So you've got that transference. Well, I could have, yeah. Well, you can show lots. I mean, you, you have to make, lot, you can show a lot, and you don't have to. The question I'm saying. Uh, I try moment, That's why you're here. Could I? Oh, sorry. What's the difference? That's basically the difference between, between. Well, when you talk about trans. Disciplinary. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking, well, what, what is that? I mean, because artists don't think generally in binary ways anyway. Mm. They will change it. You know, that, that, that's the question. Amazing. Thank you. So, quite a few questions in there, and it's obviously a good question because you're getting all of our panelists very excited <laughs> and right up. I think, yeah. So, c can I come? Can I come to Amara first, and then I'll come yes. to Ray, and then I'll come to Richard? So. Because you, I think Amara first said the phrase yes. transdisciplinary. Um, so can you talk to us a bit about what that means for you and your practice? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so for me, um, 
about 10 years ago when I um, started working professionally um, in music initially, um, I became, you know, I self-identified as an interdisciplinary artist. And I saw that what I was doing was I was, I was being a, a, a musician today and I was dabbling in theatre tomorrow and I was, you know, experimenting with something else the next day. I was exploring installations another day. But this idea of I was moving between what I understood really rigid forms and I was, you know, I was like, I want to experiment with this, I want to experiment with that. I, I believe that transdisciplinary says I don't even want to see any of those things as solid boundaries. I don't want to see that what I'm doing today is shifting from one thing to one thing to one thing. I am actually just being mm -hmm. and I'm exploring through whatever medium feels right, whatever tool, whatever, you know, um, resource feels appropriate for that spiritual thing that I'm trying to tap into. And to some people, I don't think that transdisciplinary has to be understood for for audiences i think it has to be a journey for myself um and 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 i want to hope that you know building relationships with audiences is, is that key thing it's about building relationships and you hope that you're able to build relationships but to me transdisciplinary practice is in first and foremost a commitment to myself to eliminate some of those some of those structural barriers um that exist mentally first love that thank you mm -hmm. ray what are your thoughts um, I think it's a really good question. And one f framework I would offer is the Taoist notion of yin and yang. If you've seen the symbol, it's a circle with a curved line, black and white. Um, and there's a black dot in the white part and a white dot in the black part. And what I think it conveys about duality is that there's motion and there's flow between opposites one thing doesn't exist without its opposite but that they're not necessarily rigidly separate and that there's a little bit of the opposite in the it i don't know <laughs> um and so when we're talking about binaries i think and, and these boundaries i think Increasingly, I've found that the boundaries are much more blurred or more complex and more porous than I ever thought. But um, there is a duality. And the question might be, is, the, is that duality generative? How is it creating an experience for people? And how is it, are we able to, f to flow through these pieces? Because um, I think it's in that flow state that we can connect to the spirit. And in terms of the difference between transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary, there's a, there's a field of people discussing that and, and um, interrogating that. I'm not super well read on it, but my instinct is I, I feel that inter is um, a bit more about two disciplines, like crossing between the two structured disciplines. Transdisciplinary is maybe a little bit more like transcending those structures and is more about, is more fluid perhaps. Thank you. Um, Richard, I think uh, what I'm really curious about and what um, this person is, for me, is bringing up, especially referencing punk, is this idea of working beyond binaries, boundaries, whatever you want to call it, is not new. It's something that artists have continued to think about and to, to do. Um, so I'd just love to hear your your take so, on that. funny you should say that because one of the album covers I was going to show and I didn't because I didn't want to hulk the <laughs> <laughs> and turn this into a two hour lecture um, was Pill, the metal oh. metal one so I was going to show that and I had to drop so I had to, it had to go <laughs> it had to be gone, but the other thing I didn't mention as well of course you talk about punk and I'm going to give it to you full on now, so when I was a student an art student, I was in a thrash metal band mm. and so you know what did you play? Drums Fugazi, all these bands, you know, I've um, um, uh, forgotten the names now, oh God, Field Day, um, oh, I can't remember, Dag Nasty, well, anyway, all these bands. So, and then when I left college, you know, I worked in galleries and then um, um, in Manchester, another art band where we played music, which was really like just playing a three, four minute song, which is just a chorus or it was just a verse but I didn't want to talk about all that because I just wanted I wanted to talk about 
kind of history, like what I kind of do. And it was an opportunity just to think through and to share some images. I don't know how many of these images were familiar to anybody in terms of artists. And, you know, the ways in which certain artists get pigeonholed in certain ways. So Basquiat is framed in a very particular way. And I wanted to bring in together with uh, Mondrian just to kind of, you know, break this kind of ways of looking, you know, this idea of... And I was also very conscious when I was putting this together, kind of like men, men, men. So I wanted to like, interject with some other kind of work, you know. Um, so that's why I was approaching it. Of course, you can put in punk and um, the ways in which artists, you know, produce um, artists, you know, become musicians and musicians become artists, you know. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, good question. But just so that you know, I was going to put the pill in, so I wish I had now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd swallowed the pill. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a question I really want to ask you about Basquiat and Jay-Z, and I want to see if we can get there in a second, because well, okay. I think it's really interesting. Um, but before I do ask that, I want to see if anyone else has questions, comments, things they're thinking about. I think Amara wanted to say something. Oh, sorry, Amara. But interestingly enough, I feel like you are heading in that direction with Basket and JC. So I'm <laughs> no, no, let's go. What are you going to tell us? I was, gonna, I was going to kind of pick up on the sort of the, the punk thread and something about this sort of um, history, futures uh, thing, because as a, as a hip hop nerd, <laughs> um, what I'm really interested in is sort of the origins, you know, we transport back to 70s Bronx. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, young people, African-Americans, Latinx communities, Caribbean, you know, newly arrived communities who were, who were building an art form. And, um, and the interesting thing is that art form is obviously a relationship to lots of predecessor art forms. But what I'm really interested in is the idea of um, genres of resistance like hip hop, like punk, where a social critique of their environment in one way or another were addressing the, the systemic ills of their time past and present. And so, you know, we talk so much about the idea that these were art forms that were, you know, about raising uh, a public consciousness and, you know, we're raising a, a mass public consciousness in the same way that lots of visual artistic practices were about raising a mass consciousness. Um, the bit that of artistic practice that I'm interested in is then how do we mobilize towards something once we have a level of, of consciousness? So this is where I get really excited about science fiction Walida Imarisha, Adrian Marie Brown say that all organizing is science fiction, i.e. Mm. to cultivate a world that does not exist yet mm. is an act of science fiction. And this is what I love about, you know, art in its expansiveness, in its interdisciplinariness, in its transdisciplinariness, is doing this piece about organizing, about mobilizing, about consciousness um, as an act of science fiction. I just wanted to um, just also uplift this idea of the past is now, the future is now, the present is a, is a fractal sort of microcosm of the things that have come before and the things that have yet to come. Mm -hmm. So this idea again, of science fiction and time travel, it's music that gave me a vocabulary to think about this, mm -hmm. but it was visual art that gave me a sort of embodied experience of what this time travel thing is about. And I think it links back to, you know, um, Tawi's original point about spirit, I think all of these things are about us collectively tapping into that, whether we use that shared vocabulary or not, this is the power of art. Yeah, I, you know, it's, I think, especially with science, you know, black science fiction, Afrofuturism, that period was what I think so many people connected to was the idea of seeing ourselves in the future that we continue to exist. Mm. I think about, I think, was it Spike Lee who said that about... Um, uh, who's the, who? Who are any Star Trek fans in the? Any Trekkies in in, in the house? Uh, oh, can you? Okay, see, I'm not a Trekkie, but my dad is. A, yes, I can do that. But my dad is a Trekkie. Who was? Was it? Who was the first black person in Star Trek? What's What's her name? Uhuru. Uh huh. Uhuru. Yeah. I think it was. I, I think it was Spike Lee that said to her, like, "Oh, now you're in this." people know that we'll, black people exist in the future. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about us imagining, which, you know, you have to understand, it, we didn't know if we would still get to stay around because mm -hmm. we were being not welcomed and murdered and, you know, I don't want to bring it down, but it, it's, you know. So 
I think the idea that it's now and that we're moving into Afro surrealism and, and black artists and creatives really imagining ourselves in bigger, brilliant, fantastical ways. It is about looking beyond those boxes and boundaries about what not just who we are as individuals, but as communities and, and the spaces that we that we come into. And that, that then falls into artists like Beyonce making Renaissance and songs like Alien Superstar with Honey Dijon and, and, and that being, being an, a, a fantastical surrealist imagination of who, who we are. Mm. Um, let's see if anyone else has got some questions or thoughts or things they'd like to... Yes, at the back. Yeah, cool. I'm just going to repeat the question just so everyone can hear. That was a really, really cool question. And tell me if I'm getting it wrong. But you wanted to ask about the e economic benefits of specialising and, and and how working in a more transdisciplinary way um, doesn't offer as much um, economic benefit and how that works. Um, Ray, can I come yes. to you? Because we've had conversations Absolutely. about this. Yes. So one thought is... You know, if you were in the music industry, when the pandemic hit, all of the structures, all of the rules were annulled. And the way we were trained and specialized for live performance suddenly, you know, didn't apply in the same way. And um, I think in, I think today, versatility is the new virtuosity or a new kind of virtuosity. And so the ability for musicians to be able to, you know, mix their own work, make images, uh, be business people in addition to, you know, there's a lot of different skills that we have to learn and we can learn so much from people from other disciplines. And the other thing is collaborating yes. with, is, is so essential to make anything happen. And, um, <laughs> having the privilege of co-directing Tangram, our artist collective, has really taught me that because when we pool our resources, we're able to, when we pool our credentials, we're able to get funding more easily for our projects. When we put our heads together, we're able to make things happen that we otherwise couldn't. And also we've been able to create a space for ourselves to explore art as whole artists, as, as, as entire people rather than just instrumentalists. Um, so, for example, a production that we're um, working on right now is Alex's anti-opera called Untold, which explores British Chinese identity. And in it, I'm doing some wushu, which is Chinese martial arts, where um, the, the musicians are also the kind of the storytellers and the characters. And um, because we created our own space, we could kind of create our own rules a little bit. Uh, on stage. So these are different ways that I think um, the, you know, being transdisciplinary can have economic benefits. But I also hear you about the constrictions and, and those necessities as well. Those are real. And, it's, and I, you know, maybe it's about, yeah, thank you. I think m maybe it's about finding that your areas of specialism and how that can lead into your ability to then after be able to, to collaborate and expand your practice but maybe everyone out the gate you can't maybe i don't know um amara i could see you already let's go <laughs> this <laughs> I, lo I find this a very generative question and i really appreciate um your response as well um and and i was sitting there thinking although you know that there's so much validity in specialism and you know and the and the sort of trajectories I guess but I would also like in my head I'm interrogating what if instead of specialism this was about engaging with depth 
because then rather than thinking about niche, then we start to think much more, you know, in, in sort of a mycelium sense, it's about that interconnectedness and it's about, you know, moving beyond even still singular form. So even that piece about, you know, what you just said about collaboration, I want to really just uplift that even more because that, that, you know, if we're talking about depth, then what we're actually interrogating, how might we be able to, to use our skills as instrumentalists and, I don't know, come up with, um, actually, I'll talk about a project. I've got, um, I've been building a project called Sci-Fi Collaboratory and we've been working with um, uh, musicians, visual artists, um, residents and climate scientists to imagine what, um, what the relationship is between science fiction and climate justice. So it's really, really precious when we have residents who think that they have absolutely nothing to, to say or to know about climate justice, then start to connect with, you know, um, a, 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 a keyboard player who's like, what, how do we think about acoustics in, in, a, in a just future? How do we think about spatial design? What would our architectures need to look like if they both had an acoustic quality that made sense to me as an instrumentalist? and were rooted in, um, you know, justice against noise pollution. There, there have been so many like really generative explorations, experiments, conversations that have happened because it's about depth of an idea rather than the, the sort of niche skill set. Because also I think even within our niche skill sets, we don't also know the generative offerings that we have um, that are adjacent to all the things that we've been affirmed in. Mm. We, we haven't even tapped into all the other stuff. Mm. And I, I see there's a hand I'm going to come to you in a second. But I think what the person at the back who asked the question, the, the rea there's also a realness of that some elements of someone's practice pays more than other elements. Mm -hmm. And I think as someone who's been a freelancer for a very long time before landing in the job that I'm in now, like there are some things that you do because there's, there's an income thing mm -hmm. and you need to, and it's, you get to be creative and, sure. and, and, you know, but there's other bits where, you counterbalance that across, and even in like in in all jobs, it's about finding this bit might be my most enriching bit, but oh, I got to get this contract together, you know, it's, mm. and finding a balance uh, um, overall. There's a question in the corner at the back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry can, I'm to gonna, interrupt you. Oh, okay. um, there's a fire alarm oh. and we have to evacuate the building. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really sorry, I'm wet for you. This is very temporary. Um, so, can we please make our way out by the doors? Over there. Amara, you don't have to leave. Um, hold, on, hold on the call, stay on, and I'll, I'll, one way or another, I'll let you know, okay? Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Wow. I thought you were just going to say, can you repeat the question? Oh, no, Isn't no, it? No, uh, no, get out quickly. I was like, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Actual alarm. Oh, yeah. Hey. Oh, Hiya. Yeah. We're back. We are back. Come on in. Sorry about that interruption. I suppose we should be grateful it's not an actual fire. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> It was cool. It's like having a breakout discussion. Yeah, yeah. It's like a breakout room, exactly. Chats. Breakout room. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. We never stopped. Could do come on in. Come sit near us. Come and we've now got a shared experience that we can all draw on. Shared drama. So, and a bit of coldness. So Richard's um, making this. I'll jump. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the subject of some people need to leave, I'll leave that with you. We don't have to, we don't have to leave the room right, that's right, at um, 7. I know some panelists need to leave, Dad. Okay. Well, then, so I think then we still need to close the can, Okay, then we can go into a more sort of go to the bar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fine. Cool. <laughs> okay. So thank you all, um, and apologies about 
such activities. So we, we were just, I'm going to carry on the conversation that a few of us were having outside. We were talking about the language of music and visual art and how do you know which one is the right one and how do you know if they're actually expressing the same thing. Is that accurate? Yeah. Is it what they offer each other? Yeah. What they offer each other. So... Sorry, is there like a, a, shared, a shared language? On mm-hmm. of them? Yeah. Um, so I was just about to talk about a, a programme I ran at the Horniman called 696 that was a celebration of black British music and the sounds of South London. It's wonderful. It was a response to f- the Met Police Form 696 that um, s- stopped and limited black live music in London for about 10 years. And... The reason I called the program that was because I wanted to acknowledge what had happened, but also um, do something about it with with the resources of the Horniman that I had reasonably to my disposal. And what I found in that project is that you have to talk to people. It's, I, there's a rule of marketing that you have to hit people seven times before they want to buy something. And I think, which is like, usually you'll see a poster, you'll see an advert, you'll, someone will tell you about it, and then you think, oh, actually this new cereal sounds cool Mm. Um, and I think different art forms offer you those different ways to hit Mm. a different thing so there was an exhibition that celebrated the spaces black music spaces that thrived and enabled black music to thrive despite things like 696 there was a festival that celebrated the music artists um, of South London there were programs that enabled that were residencies that enabled artists to be creative in the spaces and so having those different strands the different program i think spoke to our immediate community on our doorstep in different ways to say we are here for you we um, want to be a resource for you and we want to celebrate you so for me i think what what the different disciplines offer are different communication styles because people receive information in different ways Mm -hmm. and so by bringing them around one idea you you get to connect a a human being really that's all we're trying to do is communicate right it's to connect to someone or to to some people in a way that they might be able to receive the thing that you're feeling or thinking about that's my take what 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 are your thoughts Tara? agree with everything you said and also just i was saying about just because you were asking like how do you know though how do you know and it's that it's it's that deep understanding of the narrative and um what it is you're trying to say uh how and i communicated a lot it was there were many many conversations and you know like i said she she's not a musician so how she heard the music she would draw sketches um which is really interesting to me okay so the verse is like this 30 centimeters and i'm like wait what but it was it was so cool because at the end of it i was like you've just drawn the song that's so cool and you know it's up on my wall and um but that's how she understood it you know and 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 i and my language is through melodies and 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 chords and and so um i think it's yeah it's that just coming back to the narrative and making sure that the dialogue if you were to work with a musician that it's constant because it's constantly evolving but the more you talk and explore and dive into it you will you'll find your you know the world in which you you want to occupy you know amazing um i think we might have a couple with where um getting down to the wire on time so i want to throw it back out to Um, people in the room has anyone else got questions or things that they're curious about that's coming up through this conversation yes please um we talked outside a little bit about um skepta and the sotheby's um piece which i think is a really interesting um piece and it's about um the the sotheby's had he not already like established himself as a as a grime mc and done so well obviously not definitely not (laughs) and i need to say that yeah 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 a lot of people um, that I know started out and maybe spoken word, and then they got into theatre, and then they then they got into like writing uh, for film and TV. So mm. it's like not all art forms are equal in how accessible they are, mm. and you need to kind of start somewhere, really earn your way to get into certain things because film and TV is so expensive, for example. So I guess does anyone have any? Response? Yeah, so that's the, that's making me think right back to your question. It's 
um, about the economics of specialising, or as Amara said, depth. Like we know Skepta is hard artistically, right? Making some of the best music ever, and so people therefore are going to be more trusted. And and also the economics of it, right? We know that there's an audience. Mm-hmm. We know that people care about this person's creativity. So if they then it's then a lot. It's then a privilege to have the opportunity to work. Um, in a what, what's the term that we're using? Transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way. Um, yeah, maybe maybe part of what your question earlier was uh, was asking was about the privilege of that. That it's a, a th- to to be able to do. Amara, what do you think? Um, I was just, I, I wish I could see everyone. <laughs> I wish I was in the room. Um, but this, I, I would also add that not only is it about um, the not not um, having equal access, um, there's also something that's huge about cultural capital. Mm. Like, I would also add on to your question, would Skepta even be there if Grime didn't have mm. its globalised renaissance that came much later, you know, than its origins, that... There, there had to be some sort of uh, um, transatlantic sort of recognition of Skepta, you know, mm. and, and the, the giants of grime um, for Skepta as an individual to be platformed in that way or to, to be able to access those spaces. And I think it's so much more than 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 grime because, you know, we said Skepta was as, as infamous. Like, to me, he was like the king in 2004, you know, like... Mm. <laughs> the, 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 there's something about um, cultural capital and what is recognised and what is valued at what time that adds on to that access question, I think. Yeah. yeah it's so interesting. But I think I'm going to show my age here. I'm going to reveal. My, I often <laughs> call myself ageless, but I'm about to age myself. I, I logged, uh, maybe a year or two ago, I logged into my old MySpace account. Wow. And I found messages on there from JME promoting his music. Mm. Um, I, I had like some most, yeah, JME and Jamal Edwards, right? Both, I had direct messages from them who were just promoting stuff. And it was making me, th- which I thought was so cool to look back at yeah. and see the hustle and the, the, the yeah. grind of, which you don't see, right? You don't think, yeah, JME was DMing people in exactly. 2000 and whatever it was to promote their music and to build. And it's that, all of that and the economics of that is what has enabled them to to grow and to develop plus with this wave of what grime is now and even um top boy like there are people mm-hmm. who don't think who don't know kano mm-hmm. and they don't they don't know these people are musicians that don't know um um ashley waters as a as a um mc because they're like oh he's an actor I, do, yeah. I saw on tiktok like bro do you know that's he had beat. He had two yeah. songs in the. Dip. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for people, people yeah. of a different generation, it's. That's it. And I think that idea of, of depth, I really love that. It's a way that you can celebrate specialising, mm. and then by doing that, it gives gives you the freedom to create. I think it's a really cool question, but definitely not Skepta would not if he was no. just. He's no co- why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose you could also ask, you could also sorry to interject, but I made me think of the devil cycling to the elephant, and I saw a picture of. Stormzy in his underpants, um, you know, Kelvin Klein. So, you know, I mean, you can, uh, you know, he wouldn't be advertising uh, uh, um, um, uh, intimates if he wasn't Stormzy, do you know what I mean? You know, so, I mean, this is the kind of world, yeah, this is the world that we live in as well. And I think that has to, that's something about, you know, not all musicians or artists do that, you know, in terms of the kind of logical steps that you might make, mm. you know, and what's happening there. This is capital, you know, this is capitalism and this is a, an important part of production and what we do and how, how things are, are, are produced. Um, so it's, it's, it's a consideration, I think. Mm. And, and thinking about that cultural capital, it's interesting to think, what does it do to Sotheby's and to the kind of visual art that they sell to have somebody as culturally relevant as Skepta endorse them I think it's really really interesting and when we're thinking about audiences and their relationship to art what does that who is that introducing Sotheby's to because like, I'm not you know I'm not checking for them really I don't have the budget but um, I can see the person in red coat has got a question so, it's my question <clears throat> Me and my friends had this conversation a couple, a couple weeks ago, and so them doing this for Skepta opened the door for Sloan, 
which has opened the door for like people like Clint, which mm. opened the door for like Abel Moses. It's all sort of this new. I don't want to. I don't want to put a name on it, but you can see the people who is opening the doors for. Um, but it's now more gritty, younger black artists who you know it is their their expression will not be accepted on the wider scale. But yeah. Mm. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. I have complicated feelings about extreme. Yeah, maybe this is not. The, mm. <laughs> but I think it's you know it's not new because you can look at you know yeah. look at reggae in the seventies and the globalization of it. You know that you know so these these aren't kind of new kind of things in terms of the marketing. Obviously, with Sotheby's, you know, it's kind of them looking at kind of their products and different dimensions from being an auction house to being an education mm. institution doing education generating art, art, art scholarship to yeah. now mixing it with the musicians do you know what I mean so it's like diversifying everything can kind of diversify it's, do you know what I mean there's this kind of thing about McDonald's owns pret a mm. do you know what I mean it's like it's all you know, and that, then where do you fit in as an artist in all this kind of mayhem of, you know, this is, you know, what's incredible about artists, you know, in terms of making work that can try to, not, not resist it, because obviously people have to be realistic, but also just making work that kind of reaches people, you know, people, you know. Yeah, very cool. Um, in a moment, I'm going to see if any of our panellists have, who are also in the room and on zoom um have any questions for each other but before i do come to you guys i'm going to come back to the room and see if anyone's got any questions in the room yes please do you think drill is creative absolutely <laughs> because they use similar instrumentals and they use similar bars to sort of distinguish one artist from another mm. do you know what's really interesting i this i think we had this conversation actually when when I was curating this exhibition at the Horniman, part of, because it's a museum, you have to explain things. And a lot of museums, unlike galleries, will provide a lot of interpretation so that people can find their way into the work and they can understand it. As part of that, I needed to um, produce a glossary that had terminology for what was the, the content, including lots of different music genres and I found it really difficult to personally to define drill music because when I was researching and googling and looking at other how other people have characterized the music it was all about its association to violence mm -hmm. and s unlike other art forms or other um, music genres sorry where they're characterized much more by their musical properties compositional properties mm -hmm. and so what I what I did which was my my personal little radical thing that I or just thing I wanted to put into the world was in that exhibition to find that music <laughs> purely by its musical properties and compositional properties so that it was for me had parity with other genres of music and did not talk about it in relationship to violence at all mm. so I think for me yeah it's got it's got a distinct tempo distinct um, musical elements, uh, uh, types of rhythm, triplets that are used. So, yeah, I would say 100%. What, what, what do you think? Uh, I don't think it's creative. You don't think it's creative? No. And is that because of the process by which it happens? I think instrumentals are the same. I think the bars are the same, so I don't see a difference. Okay. In I, I think it's interesting. I don't think there's a right or a wrong, a wrong answer. It's... Often, I was talking about 696 earlier, and I think often you see limitation is what um, is, the, is the breeding ground for creativity. Mm -hmm. um, grime music, grime was heavily criticised. The perform live performances of grime were heavily criticised as people don't know how to perform, they don't know how to engage the audience, because for 10 years in London, where most of that music was being developed, it was almost impossible to put on a grime night, and so for grime artists to be able to perform live. So when they were then escalated in terms of popularity and could get on the telly um, or in front of large audiences, they hadn't built the muscle in how to do that yet. And so I, I wonder if access to resources and as they change for grime music, it will enable people to work beyond the binary of I'm going to I'm going to get a beat from someone else and I'm going to... Mm -hmm. um, 
reproduce what I think has happened. Mm-hmm. I think it's still really, really early music and in its, in its life. And so in this country, drill, the kind of wave that we mean, um, I think it's going to be cool to see how it develops. What do you think, Amara? I think the, the um, I really echo what you've said, but the thing about um, lineage is also something that's interesting, interesting to me, um, both in terms of um, narrative, in the way that you know narratives have developed, and um, as as a form of expression. Um, I'm I'm also I'm almost in this place of mind where I was like, who am I to say? You know, it, it, mm. it's people's it's people's poetry, but the bit that I am interested in is. Um, what you've said about um, from limitation comes creativity. I think that that's as true um, about the composition, about the components of the music as much as it is about the infrastructure and societal limitations. So I would always say that anything that can create something out of nothing is an act of creativity. I talk about my granddad combining water, flour, you know, a little bit of cornmeal, a bit of salt and sugar and making a dumpling as a radical act of creativity. His dumplings are like other dumplings that they're a bit different, I'm not going to lie. They're a little bit different to other people's. But, you know, this, the, it's not like the, the act of the dumpling is the sacred, precious, nobody else can ever. It's the act of making it itself. To me, I look at that as a transformation. I look at it as a tenderness. I look at it as a giving form to something that wasn't there before. How that manifests in the world and different interpretations of that are, to be honest, from my personal perspective, the bit that I'm least interested in, as opposed to, and what was that transformation for the person who was sharing that story? That's the bit that I'm interested in. If it's creative or not, I'm kind of, it's not my business almost. Mm. (laughs) That may be contentious in a space because we have been talking a lot about audiences, but I'm much more interested in the process of transformation that people go on in the act of making. Mm. There's there's somebody who gives, thank you, every time Amara speaks, I just feel like, it's just wonderful. It, um, yeah, uh, I, there's. I've, I'm, I'm terrible with names, and the name isn't coming to me. It's Pauline's daughter. Somebody um, does a talk that's about how hip hop is radically feminist because the world teaches men to not talk about their feelings, and rap music and hip hop is a space in which men are able to be emotional and to ex- express their emotions. And I think that's speaking to so. And that's within the context of derogatory, misogynistic, homophobic, lyrical content. It's acknowledging that, but going, actually, that included is still a space in which you can be vulnerable as a man. Um, and I think that the process bit is what is what is speaking to Amara. I think we've got time for maybe one final question before some of our panellists have to disappear. If anyone's got a burning one, now is your moment no pressure <laughs> yeah um, I think I think you kind of covered this before like, early in the talk but I just kind of wanted to get like a bit more expanded like what, the importance of world building in terms of music so if you look at people like Tyler the Creator for example like he creates a whole world around his around his music so he takes inspiration from like film directors and kind of implements it in his own work so I just wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on that, like the importance of world building and creating an actual experience for the listener and the audience. Is that directed at anyone specific? Um, I think it's always... Me? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think it's it's important. I think it's, um, you know, working with filmmakers and artists and uh, having conversation and dialogue and seeing how you can create a world that you really believe in and that you want people to experience is is really exciting the process that's what we were talking about it's it's interesting with Al and I as well because Al is just about the process at a gig a wreck and Al's not performing I'm performing (laughs) so I can't I can't I can't cope um so it's really interesting because you know the it is really just about creating the work for Al and for me it's about um sharing it live and 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 having you know that energy exchange with people in the room um 
so yeah for that reason I think you know different artists offer different things and give different things and they all feed into into what you're trying to share in this in and this world like just keep keep meeting creatives keep talking keep seeing who you vibrate with um because it helps you grow also as as an artist I've grown so much in this process you know it, it hasn't been easy so it's not always easy as well you know people challenge you um I challenged Al, there were tears, there was laughter, but at the end of the day, we've got this album that we're really proud of. So, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and rejoining us post Almost Fires. Thank, yes. And please join me in giving a huge round of, round of applause to everyone in the room, to our panellists, to Casper and the team that's so us. Thank you all so much. <laughs>